Section 10.2, chi-squared goodness of fit test. So this test is used to see if the percentage distribution for a population fits a given model. So what does that mean? This test will be useful when we have many proportions rather than just one. So that's how I know when to use this test. It's for proportions and it's when I have lots of proportions. So for my first example, on January 1st, 2000, we have the percentage distribution of registered voters by political affiliation in the city of Hayward. So notice I have four proportions now. I have Democrat, Republican, Independent, and other. So that's a hint to use goodness of fit when you have proportions and you have many of them. And then we wanna investigate if these percentages have changed. So that sounds like that might be my hypothesis, right? We're trying to see if they've changed or not. And so we have a recent sample of 250 Hayward residents and they produce the following frequencies. And so we have 162 Democrats now, 60 Republicans, six independent and 22 other. And so we wanna see are these percents the same or different from before? So the given percents are my claimed proportions. So these are the hypothesis proportions. And then the table below is my current sample. So just like previous hypothesis tests, we're comparing the sample to the claim. We just have more things to compare. So what is our variable here? Just to go back to chapter one. Our variable are the categories. So that would be the political party. And then is political party categorical or quantitative? It's categorical, right? Because it's described in words. So anytime we have categorical, that's when we use proportions and not means. Means are for numerical data. And why can't we use the previous proportion test? I've already said this because we have more categories, right? We have four categories now. All right, so let's see if we can do a hypothesis test. So does the data provide enough evidence at 5% to show that the political party distribution in Hayward is different from what it was in January 2000. So this one's a little bit harder to write as a formula um, because there's lots of proportions, but if I wanted to write it as a formula, it would be, there'd be four Ps. So this is why we just write it in a sentence instead. But my four proportions would be those given proportions. So P1 would be the Democrats at 0.7096. P2 would be the Republicans at 0.2335, independent at 0 0.0223, and other at 0.0346, right, just in decimal form. So the easier way to do this is just say that the political party distribution is the same as it was in 2000. So this would be same as 2000. So as the hypothesis tests get a little more complicated, it's often easier to just write sentences. And then we're going to say for H1 is what we're trying to prove is that they're different. So the political party of registered voters is different than what it was in 2000. And this is why we can't quite do an equation. Um, because we're just saying it's different. We don't know what's different. Are all of them different? So maybe P1 is different, P2 is different, but then P3 and P4 could be the same. Maybe P1's the same and P3 and P4 changed. So there's just, right, we don't know which ones changed and which ones didn't. It could be that all of them changed or just two of them changed. So that's why, again, it's just easier to write it in words. Um, and then step two will be the same that it's been all this time, so what's alpha? Alpha is our significance level at 5%, so 0.05. So even though the process is a little bit different, the steps are the same. So step three is gonna be slightly longer. Um, this is where we normally do the z-score or the t-score, but now we're gonna do a chi-square score instead. So for this test, you have to use chi-square. 
So it's going to take a little bit of time. If you make a table, it helps. So to calculate this, we're gonna compare the differences in what we saw in our sample. So that'll, I'm gonna call that the observed column. That's what we saw in our sample. And we're gonna compare it to um, what we would expect if the null hypothesis was true. So that's this third column or fourth column. And we're gonna add some stuff in. So observed is just what did we see in our sample? So if you go back to the table, this is what we observed in the sample. 162 for Democrats, 60 for Republicans, six for independent, and 22 for other, and they added up to 250, because that was the sample size. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a column called P. It's the claim per cents. So this is my hypothesis values now. So that's the hypothesis, or you can go back to the percents. Since I already wrote them in decimal form, I'm gonna use these ones here, because we want them in decimal form. So this is just scratch work, this column. So we're just gonna write down the percents and we'll use them in a second. So we had 0 0.7096 for Democrats, 0 0.2335 for Republicans, 0 0.0223 for independence, and then 0 0.0346 for other. So these are the claim, this is my hypothesis. And we, what we're gonna do is kind of see how different my sample is from the hypothesis. So we can't really compare them right now because my sample is in numbers of people and my percents are percents. So that's where the expected column comes into play. So expected is um, how many do we expect how many people in each category? If the percents didn't change, if percents are the same. So this is what would happen if Hayward political parties didn't change. So we're gonna do N times P. So N is 250. My sample size is 250, and we're going to multiply each of these by 250. And that should tell us how many people we should have gotten if the percents didn't change. So for Democrats, 250 times 0 0.7096. If we still have 70% Democrats, then we should have about 177.4 in my sample. For Republicans, it would be 23.35% of 250, which is 58.375. Same idea for um, independents, we should have 5.575, and then for other, we should have 8.65. And I'd probably, what I usually do is add these up, they should add up to 250, because my sample size is 250. So this is what should happen in the sample if there is no change. And then we're gonna compare it to what actually happened in the sample. So this is if everything's the same and this is what actually happened. So to me, if I look at Republicans, there's really not much change, 60 compared to 58. Um, if I look at independents, six compared to 5.575, right, not a big change. Um, other, 22 and 8.65 definitely has a bigger change. And Democrats, I'm a little unsure, 166 compared to 177. 162 compared to 177. So we're going to find this new thing called chi-square. So we're going to find this new calculation, which I'll formally define shortly. We're going to do O minus E, so it's different from z-scores. We're going to square it and divide by E. So we're basically going to find the difference and then we're gonna square it just to kind of get rid of that negative issue and then compare it to the expected by dividing. So let's see. So we're gonna do 162 for the first one in parentheses minus 177.4. We're gonna square it and we're gonna divide by 177.4. 
And these are gonna be like mini Z scores, which we'll talk about shortly. Let's do 1.337. So if you feel confident, maybe try the next one. The next one will be, I think we have 60 in the sample, minus 58.375. We're gonna go ahead and square it and divide by 58.375. So we're basically kind of finding like a little mini z-score for each row. It's just a different formula. So it's not quite a z-score, but similar idea. And I got 0 0.045. Cool. And then maybe just trust me on independent. Check if you want to. Let's jump to other and we get 22 from the sample. Minus 8.65 squared divided by 8.65. And I'm expecting the largest number here because this one had the largest change. The largest difference. and we get 20.60 and that'll round up to four. So this one was the largest change. All right, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add them up. So I'm gonna add up these four numbers and then we'll talk about that. So we'll add them up. And so we add up that column and we get a total of 22.018. And that is our test stat. So that's our chi-square value. So the formula is telling me to find the sum. Remember that fancy symbol, that big fancy E means sum. So that means we want a total. And then we found the O minus E squared over E column. So this is what we're gonna use instead of z-scores. So it looks funny, 22 looks big, but chi-square is just a different curve. So I don't really know if this is big or not yet. So this is instead of z or t. So we did a lot of work for it, but we're finally done and then everything will feel really similar after this. So if HO is true, then our chi-square value should be near zero. Remember chi-square starts at zero. And then as we go farther and farther out, then we have larger and larger evi strong evidence. So large values of chi-square will provide strong evidence to, re uh, to reject HO. So that should make sense visually, right? As we go farther and farther out the curve, it's less likely to be just random. So let's go ahead and figure out how to find the p-value. So if HO is true and certain requirements are met, which we'll talk about shortly, um, then the chi-square um, has the chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom k minus 1, where k is categories. So it's not sample size anymore, it's categories. So let's go ahead and find the p-value. So instead of drawing the normal curve, we'll draw the chi-square curve. It's right skewed. Um, our degrees of freedom will be categories minus 1, we had four categories, minus one, and we get three. So that means our curve peaks around three. So big thing to remind yourself, it's categories, not sample size for chi-square. And then we wanna find the area to the right of the value that we just found, 22.018. Because it's a right skewed curve, it's always right tailed, which is different from the normal curve. So we're gonna go ahead and find the p-value. So instead of using normal CDF, we'll use chi-square CDF, otherwise same idea. We'll do our lower of 22.018. Our upper would be infinity, because we keep going. And degrees of freedom would be three. So go ahead and type that on your calculator, and then we're almost done. Chi-square, CDF, lower is 22.018, upper 10 to the 99, and we'll have three degrees of freedom, 
and we get this small number, 6e to the negative 5. This is not 6, right? Probabilities are always between 0 and 1. This is 0 0.00006. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's very, very small. It's very little risk of type 1. So all the same rules from chapter 9, just a new test. Um, our cutoff was 0 0.05, which we're well below. That was alpha. So because it's very little risk, we're going to go ahead and reject. HO, we're rejecting that the proportions are the same. So there is enough evidence, or there is strong evidence, if you like that word better, at 5% to show that the political party distribution of registered voters in Hayward is different from what it was in 2000. So we're rejecting that it's the same, right, to prove that it's different. So I'm just going to go through the process, and then um, we'll talk about the requirements as we go through this. So the process for chi-square, goodness of fit, um, should feel pretty similar, um, just a few small changes. So I'll highlight the changes. So the new changes are the um, requirements are now that the expected frequencies are all greater than or equal to 5. Um, step 1 is essentially the same, right? Just find H1 and H2, HO and H1. Um, step 2 is find alpha, right? Nothing's changed. Um, step 3 is where it gets a little messy. We have a new formula for the test statistic, and that's where we made the table. If you make a table, this is easier. So we did O is observed, and E is the expected, so E equals NP. Um, so P is the percentage for each category we expect if HO is true, and O is what we observed in our sample. O for observed. And so that steps the long step, and then it gets fast after that. So um, step four is chi-square CDF rather than normal CDF. Degrees of freedom is categories minus one, and it will always be right-tailed. And then five and six should feel very similar. Um, make a conclusion. And then I like to think of the little O minus E squared as little mini Z scores. So I'll talk about that in part C. Um, so part B, were the requirements met? So I'm going to go ahead and copy the table over. It's a little messy, but that's OK. Were the requirements met? So we're going to go ahead and look at the E column. Were all the expected frequencies at least 5? Yeah. Independent just barely made it, but it did. So yes, all expected frequencies are at least five. So different rules. And then which categories provided the most and the least evidence? So that's where the little mini z-score idea comes into play. So I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna call these my mini z-scores. And so, Close to zero is weak evidence, right? And as it gets bigger and bigger, it's strong evidence. So the least evidence would be the weakest. So the weakest would be independent because it's closest to zero. The z-score is closest to zero, right? 0 0.032, that's weak evidence, close to zero. So independent would be the least evidence. Independent didn't really change. Um, Republican would be a close second, right? Because it's also very close to zero. And then the strongest evidence would be the biggest mini z-score. So that looks like other, right? Other was at 20.604. So that's strong evidence, right? It's far from zero. So other would be the strongest or the most. So I know that was a long example, but we did it.